One of life's biggest questions is, what happens to us when we die? I don't know how many theories there are trying to answer that question. They range based on religion, non-religion, and worldviews. But because there have been so many answers to that question, it's easy to have questions or even to remain undecided. The biblical teaching about what happens to us when we die can be summarized in one word, resurrection, life after death. Now, if that idea seems crazy to you, you're not alone. Did you know that there were people in the Bible who didn't believe in resurrection? Paul had traveled to Athens, Greece, and was starting to do some teaching. When he was there, there were some Greek philosophers who immediately dismissed, dismissed him as an idle babbler because he was talking about the resurrection. They were willing to hear him out, but when they heard him talking about the resurrection again, it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 32, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They were just making fun of him because he was talking about the resurrection. Now, before you put them in a box and say, well, of course they didn't believe in the resurrection. They were pagans. Did you know that there were some Jews who believed in God and read their Bibles and still didn't believe in resurrection? Paul, later in Acts, was on trial, and he was presented to a diverse group of Jews, some calling themselves Pharisees and others calling themselves Sadducees. And he knew that this issue divided them. And so he lobbed the philosophical hand grenade into the crowd saying, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. After that, all he had to do was watch the fireworks erupt because the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection started defending him and the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection started dissenting. Luke records in Acts chapter 23, verse eight, it says, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. It was into this polarized world that Jesus came teaching about the resurrection. The Sadducees, the same group who took aim at Paul, first took aim at Jesus. They wanted him discredited. Now, before we get to the showdown between these Jewish teachers and Jesus, Let's take a look at who these Sadducees are. The Sadducees were as much a political group as they were a religious one. They had cozied up to Rome, and because of that, they enjoyed the finances and the positions that came from that association. You might also call them religiously conservative because they narrowed all of their beliefs into only the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy those that were written by Moses. And because of that, they dismissed the concept of resurrection because it fell into the category of those five books don't mention it. David McClister, in his lecture in 2019 at Florida College, posited another reason why the Pharisees might have dismissed the concept of the resurrection. It's because resurrection was constantly tied to the hope of a new kingdom. Chapters like Ezekiel chapter 37, which show an army being raised from the dead, dry bones coming together, tie the concept of resurrection to a new kingdom. And if you, like the comfortable Sadducees, enjoyed the current political climate, then you weren't necessarily looking for its end and the establishment of a new kingdom. It was easy to dismiss. This is the group that now comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27, with a question that is designed to discredit the resurrection. But it's going to be Jesus' answer that's going to teach us what the Bible has to say about it. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, says this. And Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. They questioned, they asked him a question saying, teacher... Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, that the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, 
and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. The, fair, the Sadducees posed this question to Jesus trying to make the resurrection seem ridiculous. Now, this might even be more ridiculous to the modern reader because it's based in what was called Leveret Marriage Law. First revealed in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, it explained that if a man died, leaving a wife but no kids, that his brother was supposed to marry her and try to produce offspring for the first brother you have full permission to say yuck. But, unfortunately, the Old Testament theology of inheritances is a conversation for another day. There's a classic movie called Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. <laughs> it depicts uh, burly, bearded men in flannel singing with great lyrics like, I'm a lonesome pole cat and swinging axes. This question by the Sadducees is almost like the worst version of that story. It's not seven brides for seven brothers, it's one bride for seven brothers. A man had died and he left the wife and no kids and so each of seven brothers marry her trying to produce that heir and all eventually dying. She was always, always, always the bride. And then finally, the woman dies. And the Sadducees questioned them to Jesus is, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? If this whole thing sounds ridiculous, then you're starting to get the picture. Because the Sadducees are posing this question in such a way as to make the whole concept of resurrection itself seem crazy. But here's Jesus' response. Jesus says in Mark chapter 12, beginning verse 24, Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read the book of Moses in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, or the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the living or of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. We can learn a few things about resurrection from this answer from Jesus. The first is that there is a resurrection. Is Jesus being tactless when he begins and ends his answer by saying, you're wrong? He says, you're wrong in verse 24, and you are quite wrong in verse 27. This sounds presumptuous and kind of rude. The way that Jesus speaks exposes, though, something about Jesus and the answer to the question. That is, that there is a resurrection. For everyone else, what happens after death had been a hope, a guess, a theory, one that could be wrong and it could be right. And it was always subject for debate. But Jesus answers this question definitively, saying, you are wrong, and saying that the Sadducees had missed it. He doesn't leave this contradiction without proof, though. He bases his argument in the scripture and in the power of God. So from scripture, Jesus argues from the story of the burning bush. It was the time when God appeared to Moses, commissioning him to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to release the Israelites from their slavery. Before you think that Jesus is picking some obscure, random proof text, you should remember that the Sadducees, they only believed in the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Jesus goes to Exodus in the very heart of that section to prove his point. 
But the second reason why this passage is so important is because it is this passage which honestly gives the best introduction to God because it is the passage in which God is in a sense introducing himself to Moses. And when he does, he says, I am. As a name, I am. I'm the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He introduces himself by a ceaseless existence. But Jesus brings this passage into further clarity when he says um, that on this occasion concerning Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, that God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They've been dead for centuries. But God isn't putting his relationship with them in a past tense. He's saying, I am their God. That is, their continued existence still calls on him as God. But Jesus also asserts the resurrection based in the power of God. I appreciate the way that Paul phrased it in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17. Speaking of Abraham, he says that God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. The chief power of God is that of creator, the one who gives and sustains life. And he's not limited by death, and he's not going to be conquered by it. And the amazing thing is that power of God to give and sustain life is also at work in Christians, those who belong to Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, you, however, are not of the flesh, but, of, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The final thing that we can learn, though, about the resurrection from Jesus' answer is that it's different. The Sadducees based their question on the assumption that everything in the resurrection is the same as it is on earth. Relationships are the same and we are the same. But Jesus states, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Jesus' assertion shows that our relationships will not be the same. That comes as a shock to the system for everyone who is hoping that heaven will simply be one big reunion with my grandfather there or with old friends who have passed away. Is that why you want to go to heaven? Our chief aim and our highest hope is not that our relatives are going to be in heaven or even our spouse, but that God himself will be there and that we can establish our relationship with him. I like the way that David Garland put it. He says, one may guess that death must be something very much like birth. Before birth, a child is totally surrounded in what is a safe and warm environment and gets all of his life from his mother, but he does not see his mother. When birth comes, it must be quite a shock to the child. The baby leaves the safe, warm confines of the mother's womb and enters the harsh, bright, cold world. But only after birth is the child able to see its mother and be held and kissed. In life on this earth, we are totally surrounded by God who sustains our lives, but God remains invisible to us. When death comes to each of us, it may be a shock to the system, but then we will see God who gave us life, nourished us, and gives us life again. I've got a few questions for you that I want you to consider as we wrap up. The first is, Jesus proved the resurrection when he defeated death and left the tomb empty. How has the empty tomb shaped your attitudes about your own impending death? Second question. How does the shift in the nature of human relationships change your anticipation about the resurrection? Third question. 
According to Paul in Acts chapter 6, the resurrected life does not begin when our heart stops beating. The Christian begins at baptism to live a new kind of life. What can you do today to live out your resurrection hope?